Uh, thanks very much. Um, just checking if you can hear me and see the presentation. Yes, we can. Excellent. So um, thanks very much for the introduction. Um, it's Steve here. Um, we're going to talk about a project we've been running which tracks the growth in apartments in Melbourne against the change in public transport services over a 19 year period. Um, I'm going to do a lot of the talking at the start, talking about what our project did and what we found, uh, perhaps for around 20 minutes. Um, and then we're hoping to have a, a, a good, frank and full discussion, um, hopefully touching on how our findings might be useful to you. Um, at that point, we might get into some more policy issues. And I think once we're at that point, um, Eric will be having a lot more to say. Uh, this is the team that put together the report. So Chris is our project leader. Um, Eric is particularly focusing on the policy aspects. And I was particularly doing the, the number crunching and the graph drawing. Um, last month, we produced a report with the catchy title of Tracking the Development of Apartment Housing Activity Against Public Transport Service Provision in Melbourne, 2004 to 2022. Um, and we have a project website, which the link is here, that you can look at um, if you're interested. Um, and uh, we have here the link to our full report that we, we put out. Uh, so this slide sets the scene um, for why we dwelt, why we delved into this. Um, integration of high density housing and public transport is obviously a policy goal, and integration is obviously a good thing. Uh, we found though that it hasn't been much measured. Um, and while issues of equity in public transport have been researched, the research usually hasn't focused specifically on high density housing. Um, what we did was track growth in apartment numbers. Um, over 19 years uh, against public transport services, uh, looking at both the raw numbers of the services and also adjusting the number of services. Oh, yeah. this is gross. Adjustment, uh, yeah, also looking at raw numbers and looking at adjustments to take account of vehicle capacity size, which turned out to be a very relevant issue. Um, this is all highly relevant, obviously, as you all know, um, in Melbourne, where there's been a lot of apartment growth along public transport corridors. Um, high population growth, and indeed in inner Melbourne, um, apartments are now a majority of the dwellings. Um, there's a little map with our radial train and tram network, the principal public transport bus network routes in green, some of them actually exist, um, and then the other bus routes in grey, so that's just for context. Just an example of what we're talking about, this is Ligon Street, East Brunswick in 2009, and in the same place 10 years later, with obviously a lot of the uh, so now the technical bit, where for the next couple of slides, I'm going to build up and talk about sort of our method of what we did. So you may find this bit boring, can have a quick drink. Um, we've got apartment data, which came from Department of Transport and Planning. It's a data set of major redevelopment sites, and um, it starts from uh, 1 July 2003. So that's the start of the period we were able to analyse. Um, major redevelopment sites comes with a couple of exclusions. It only covers developments of 10 or more dwellings and it doesn't cover greenfield sites. So we looked at building permit data and found that about 6% of apartments have fewer than 10 dwellings. Um, so probably when we're giving apartment numbers, they're probably understated by the that 6% figure. Um, Greenfield's growth areas sounds like it's another exclusion, but um, when we looked at another set of data that we got from DTP, we found there, there aren't very many apartment blocks being built in the Greenfield's growth areas. So that's less of an issue. Um, so, you know, a flowchart with our data cleaning process, which was basically eliminating duplicates from the complicated data set and allocating it to financial units. Uh, adding in the public transport data, we also got this from Department of Transport and Planning. Um, goes back for train and tram to 2001, very nice. Uh, this is from their data set that they use to monitor contractual performance by the franchisees. So it tells you the number of services on each line and to some extent a breakdown by station. Um, for bus, the stuff from DTP only went back a few years. So we found the GTFS, you know, transit feed stuff from Public Transport Victoria was, was a better bet. Though even that only went back seven years. So our analysis only partly deals with bus services, um, but um, train and tram are really the main modes for the areas that have high numbers of public development. Um, now, apart from service numbers, we looked at vehicle capacity. 
Uh, so for trams, it's mostly the trend to replace the older, shorter trams with the longer, newer ones. And Yarra Trams helped us with the data of the fleet allocations at all of their depots. So we were able to look at the mix of tram classes on each route and how that changed over the years. Um, for trains, uh, three things happened really. Um, first, some lines moved from partial three carriage operation to full time six carriage operation. So that in increased capacity on those lines. And um, second, there was a sort of general capacity increase in 2017 when seats were removed from most trains so that more people could fit on the trains by standing. And then the third capacity increase was the introduction of the seven carriage HCMTs on some lines, which is pretty recent. Um, so that gives us the numbers of services and a picture of the capacity of the vehicles running. So that gives us the overall annual departments and a monthly picture of public transport services with and without capacity. Uh, then we pick an area, or we pick lots of areas. We look at local government areas. Uh, we look at uh, train and tram corridors, Theory, we can pick other little areas that we want. Um, we um, find the train stations and the stops, the tram and bus stops that are within walking distance of the apartments that we're looking at. Um, for walking distance, we pick 800 metres, which is about a 10 minute walk. Um, find the stations and stops um, within that 800 metres, uh, and then we can extract the, um, the, the numbers of um, vehicles, the numbers of services that are stopping at those stops. Uh, and build up a picture of the um, the overall services in our area. So volumes both with and without capacity adjustments. So that's the method. Thank you for listening to that. On to some results. Um, so the overall results, now this is for Greater Melbourne as a whole. Specifically, it's the areas within Greater Melbourne that, are, that have apartments or that are within 800 metres of apartments. So apartment growth is those grey bars, and that's up 87% over the 10-year period. Train and tram services for those apartments, the orange line, and that's up around 5%, a lot less. Perhaps more fair to look at population. After all, it's people that catch the trains, not the apartments. Um, so if we look at the population in the areas within 800 metres of the apartments, um, that is up around 32%. So the number of um, public transport services hasn't kept up with that either. Then the next thing to add in is adjusting those numbers of public transport services for the capacity of the vehicles. And that's where we see a change. So capacity adjusted services are up 35%, a lot more than the unadjusted 5%, and roughly keeping track with population. So that's the, that's the overall picture, once you take account of capacity in the areas around apartments, services as a whole have kept up with population growth, but they've done it by adjusting the capacity of the vehicles, not by providing more frequent services. Um, so it's not the same everywhere. Let's pick a couple of areas and I um, apologise for randomly picking a couple of that probably are from some people here and aren't for other people. Um, but these two graphs compare Upfield and Frankston rail corridors. So they're both corridors that have quite a lot of apartment growth. Again, looking at those grey bars to show the apartment growth. Um, in Frankston, um, services, service growth has outpaced population growth. That is the orange line is higher than the purple line, um, even before you adjust for capacity. Um, while in Upfield, that is not the case. Uh, lots of apartments, population growth, outstripping the raw numbers of train services, which have only gone up by about 7%. So really the overall position um, is tram services on most routes have hardly changed in 20 years, um, but the vehicles are bigger, so you fit more people on. Um, train services have become more frequent on a couple of routes, in particular timetable improvements on the Frankston and Dandenong lines and to some extent Werribee, um, but most of the increases in train services um, have come from increasing capacity and in particular by removing seats. Now, all those graphs, we've, um, we've built an online dashboard that shows the plots that I've been showing. Um, so I'm just going to run through a one and a half minute video that displays this online dashboard, which you're welcome to have a look at. Um, um, I should warn, when we made this video, it was a prototype before we had the final year of apartment numbers. So some of the figures understate the apartments a little compared to what the live version of the dashboard actually shows. So let me run this. Um, start by showing Greater Melbourne as a whole, 
uh, drop down menu that lets you select other areas, local government areas or transport corridors. And then you can pick which of the four sets of data you want to display, apartment numbers, population, public transport services, adjusted for capacity. You can select which mode. By default, it only shows train and tram, for which we have data for the full 19 years. Uh, for bus, we've only got data from 2016. So if you select bus, you'll see a smaller range of years. There's a slider that lets you select your own range of years. Um, apart from the main graph, uh, we've got in the middle, we've got that dashboard at the upper right, which is the headline figures showing the um, change over the selected period, apartment numbers, population, public transport. For example, if we select an area, Burundara, um, graph changes to show Burundara's figures and the map changes to show the apartments in the relevant area. Um, you can play around with the map, you can click on a development and see some details such as when it was constructed and um, how many apartments. Um, I think it's going to click on another one. There we go. Yes, that's, that's how the map works. Uh, we'll go to another example, which will be one of the tram corridors. It's going to be tram cor corridor route one. Um, again, everything changes to show route one. And um, then perhaps the last thing to display is that after filling around with sliders, you can hover over the, the graph and um, see precise figures for the data you've selected. And then at the bottom here, we've got a link to where the dashboard is, and you are welcome to play around with it. If anyone finds any problem that it's not working, um, which might happen if I might need to step up the usage if a lot of people use it. If anyone finds any problems, please let me know. Fix them. Right, so that was the dashboard. Um, moving on to talk about equity a little bit. Uh, this is one of the things we wanted to investigate. Um, we looked at whether the areas with improved services corresponded particularly to areas with socioeconomic advantage or disadvantage? And the short answer is not particularly. Um, so this graph shows the position for each local government area. And that's every blog is a local government area with the colour coding showing whether they're inner, middle or outer local government areas. Um, we'll get to a slide in a minute that'll show which is which. Um, the x-axis on the bottom is the mean socioeconomic advantage or disadvantage index for the LGA. So 10 is the highest, most advantaged, and 1 is the lowest, most disadvantaged. Um, so we see that the blue inner LGAs tend to be the ones with the higher uh, values in this, this, um, this concept. Then the y-axis on the side shows the total number of public transport services in the closing year, that is 2022. Um, so the higher on the graph on the left, the more services there are. Uh, so there's a slight relationship, you know, the, the line that tries to draw the best fit between all the dots shows a slight curve. Um, there's a slight relationship with more services in areas of higher advantage, but it's pretty, it's a pretty weak relationship. Now, this is different from other research, which uh, certainly does show more of a relationship between disadvantage and lack of public transport, typically disadvantage in outer suburban areas with poor transport. So our finding is that that, inec that particular inequity is less of an issue for the particular areas where apartments are being built, remembering that we're just looking at the areas within 800 metres of apartment buildings, and those areas tend to be close to the train lines rather than relying on perhaps poor bus services. But to put this around another way, what we're not seeing is any indication that the best services are being pushed to areas with the most disadvantage, which equity might suggest would be a good thing. Um, a development of that previous plot, this one is um, has, still has along the bottom the index of relative socioeconomic advantage and disadvantage, same as before. But the y-axis, instead of showing the absolute number of services, is showing the number of services per person in the LGA. And here we really can't find a statistical relationship at all. So sadly, having done this and looked for a story around how fair it all is, um, we didn't. Okay. On to um, uh, talking a little bit about integrating land use and public transport. Uh, so what is the relationship between them? This graph first, this plot shows the change in apartments, uh, grey bars, population, yellow uh, orange triangles, and train and tram services adjusted by capacity for each local government area over the 19-year period, the change for the period. Again, the local government areas are grouped into you know, middle and outer. Um, and again, rem reminder that we're only looking at areas within 100 metres of apartments. So apartment and population growth, those are the grey bars and the orange triangles, they do seem a little bit correlated with each other um, in the inner areas. 
there's a sort of weak relationship between those in the middle areas and then not much of a relationship at all in the outer areas. And that's not surprising because there aren't so many apartments in the outer areas. The population growth is occurring because of other things, um, standalone houses. Um, so those two things, that's the correlation there. Then when we look at whether um, public transport provision, the blue circle, is correlated with um, apartment growth or population growth, there's really no picture. It's not really reacting to either of those, or it's not. it seems to be changing independently of, of both those things. But when we look at where public transport um, growth is occurring compared to where the apartments were 20 years ago, we do see a correlation. So the x-axis along the bottom, this is the number of public transport services at the start of that period in 2003-2004. Um, then the y-axis is the number of apartments that have been built over the period. Um, that is, the more services an area had 20 years ago, the more apartments have been built there. Um, that is, public transport is not being provided to match apartment growth. Um, rather, apartments are being built in places that already had better public transport. So, what conclusions do we draw from this before we have a bit of a discussion? Um, first, uh, little evidence that public transport is um, changing in response to apartment development. It's changing in response to other factors, and perhaps that includes uh, growth in uh, housing types other than um, apartments, like Greenfield's development, or perhaps it includes other things. Um, so the relationship is not that way, rather the relationship is the other is a, is a one-way one. Apartments are going to places that already have good public transport. Um, public transport has kept pace with population growth overall, though of course not the same in every area, but overall it has kept pace with population growth, but it's by using larger vehicles, not increasing frequency. So this is a bit of a lost opportunity because as um, I think many of you would probably say, uh, frequency is a key driver in helping people choose public transport. Most people would rather wait 10 minutes for a small tram than 20 minutes for a long one, but that's not what we've been doing. Um, capacity adjusted services have kept up with population growth overall, but it's not equal across the city. Um, but we didn't find a particular relationship between um, public transport and socioeconomic advantage in areas near apartments. So in those areas near apartments, there's not a particular equity issue, except in the sense that you might hope to see um, more resources directed at those who are disadvantaged. Um, so that sort of brings me to the end of my prepared remarks, and we should um, go over to have some discussion. But before, before I do that, um, Eric, is there anything you'd like to add at, at this point? Uh, well, I, just some practical uh housekeeping matters steve there's been a bit of chat while you were you were um talking and for those people who haven't looked in the chat um i've posted a link to the project website where you can find the the, the background papers and i've also uh, posted a link to the dashboard now somebody did report that they were having trouble with the link to the dashboard so may but but if so, if you're having trouble with the link to the dashboard, I'd suggest you go to the project website and maybe get access to the dashboard via the project um, website. And uh, we've had a request for a copy of the slides. So I think uh, we're happy to make a copy of the slide presentation available at the end of the presentation.